Right on. Well, thank you all for uh, joining us for the 1030 presentation on the importance of veterans in the cannabis industry. I am your MC for the discussion, Shango Los. I am host of the Shaping Fire podcast. If you enjoy learning from the top minds in the cannabis industry, I encourage you to visit shapingfire.com to enjoy in-depth interviews on cannabis business, health, and technique that will provide you with actionable information without wasting your time. Um, recent guests have included OG cultivator Kevin Jodry from Wonderland Nursery, uh, the cannabis terpene neurologist Dr. Ethan Russo, geneticist Dr. Reggie Godino on cannabis plant patents, uh, cannabis breeder Mean Jean of Mendocino, and Natasha Riz on using cannabis ball root as medicine, and many, many other folks. So uh, postcards for the show are available up here near the stage. And uh, if you want to um, share this presentation with others who are not here, a video of this panel will appear on my YouTube page next week. And you can find that uh, channel at youtube.com forward slash Shango Those. So the U.S. cannabis industry is growing at a rapid rate, as we all know. And U.S. veteran advocates and entrepreneurs are playing a big part. Uh, our panel this morning will focus on the importance of veteran involvement in the shaping of this emerging industry. And our guest speakers, uh, Ellen Brown and Amber Center, who will be uh, with us momentarily, will discuss the genesis of some of these veteran-led cannabis organizations and describe how other veterans and civilians can do the same. Ellen Brown is a master cultivator. She has mentored hundreds of cannabis growers throughout the U.S. over the last 10 years. She's also a veteran in the United States Air Force and was awarded the Air Combat Command Nutritional Medicine Airman of the Year Award in 2008. As founder of Sensimia Seminars, Ellen has taught cannabis cultivation, health and business to students, patients, caregivers throughout US and Jamaica. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, introduce Amber now and she'll just join the conversation when she gets here. Amber Center is founder of Leisure Life a lifestyle and infused cannabis products company. She's also co-founder of Supernova Women, formed in 2015. This organization is dedicated to empowering people of color uh, to become self-sufficient cannabis industry shareholders. Amber is a US Coast Guard veteran and a former COO of Magnolia Wellness. So please put your phones on vibrate if you haven't already done so, and please hold your questions until the end. So let's offer Ellen, and when she comes in, Amber, a round of applause. So to get us started, um, I want to ask you, Ellen, what aspects of your military experience especially prepared you for working in the cannabis industry? Thank you. Um, so my name is Ellen Terry Brown. I'm a United States Air Force veteran. And what I did in the service was um, nutrition, so nutritional airmen. And part of my job was teaching one-on-one -on -one classes as well as teaching uh, large classes for uh, prenatal care, gestational diabetes. Uh, if you failed your PT test, I would be the first person you would see. So what I was able to take away from that was learning how to teach, learning how to do one-on-one -on -one patient counseling, and how to create curriculum, which I found very much transferable to Sensimia seminars. So I used my uh, abilities to teach, create uh, educational material that was easy to understand, and then with that I've been able to really perpetuate education on the East Coast. So um, <clears throat> another thing that I was able to take away from the military was being able to uh, find people that I could rely on and know that my strengths would complement their weaknesses and vice versa. So uh, really putting myself out there and finding my, my cannabis community, much like my, my brother in arms, I have my, my brothers in cannabis. I can imagine that um, the, the intimate role that you played with interviewing soldiers um, who are probably not always as upfront about their physical wellness as they could be because, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, weakness is, is shamed and, and, and folks always want to let their uh, spirit officers believe that they're always 100%. Um, and and you, you learn how to create that intimacy as well, which I can imagine um, is important when working with veterans in the cannabis industry. Absolutely. Uh, when I would do the one-on-one -on -one patient counseling, people could be there for a wide variety of reasons, and sometimes they were very receptive to the information I was going to impart on them, whether or not that was setting up a nutritional program, whether or not it was them coming back weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, and with cannabis, it's that same thing. People come in with a little bit of trepidation, or when they come in, I have to kind of pull out from them, well, what do you want, what are you thinking? 
and just having patience and understanding, especially from coming from the medical field, because cannabis is a medicine. You do have your endocannabinoid system, your CB1 receptor, your CB2 receptor, which a lot of people uh, aren't as educated on as they would like. So I've been able to uh, teach them that information and then have them go on to be their own best advocates is really uh, what I like to drive home, whether or not it was teaching my nutritional classes, where we would sit down and then you would come back and tell me how your results were when you were away. And with this, I will give you all the tools you need to be able to uh, better understand your own endocannabinoid system, your own self-titration dosing, what works best for you. So uh, actually, as I'm saying it, it is, it's very much transferable for when I was having, creating those different nutritional plans for people. Now we're creating different uh, cannabis plants for people, whether or not it's, uh, I have a four by four space, what streams can I grow? Or I have an outdoor field in Maine, what can we do? So sitting down and seeing what resources we have um, and then just growing from there. Um, I know that you know, our industry has got a lot of uh, inside vocabulary and uh, certainly the military does as well. Um, do you find that uh, having a pre-existing shared vocabulary with the veterans helps you bring them up to speed in cannabis because um, that vocabulary tends to cause them to warm up to you faster because they can they can tell that that uh, you have shared past experience with them? That's a fantastic question. What I find with veterans is kind of that saying, once a Marine, always a Marine, even though I was the Air Force and uh, Amber was in the Coast Guard and people come from all different branches. When you meet somebody who's a fellow service member, you feel almost an immediate connection. You know that they have something in common with you that you don't have in common with maybe your spouse, your friends, your family. It, it connects you almost immediately. Same with cannabis, when you smoke that cannabis. So uh, we're able to form a relationship built on trust because we both know we were in the service. And then from there, we're able to take that a step further when we start to talk about cannabis and was talk about, hey, how was your military service? And sometimes veterans don't like to open up because um, it's hard talking to civilians or hard talking to people that don't understand. And then when a veteran talks to another veteran, that veil just goes down. Mm -hmm. And they, we, can, we can talk shop, as it were, and say, hey, this is why I'm, I'm medicating. These are the problems I've had. This is what it was like when I deployed. And with that, um, it's really able to break down that wall and get them to talk about what did, how was that experience for you? Because some people did experience combat. Some people do have PTSD, depending on your service. Some people did uh, experience sexual trauma. And those are the things that, you know, for being in the Air Force and working in the medical field, just being patient and understanding and, you know, let, let people talk about things in their own time. Same thing like cannabis. Well, how much do you smoke? How often do you smoke? Have you found that this helps you? And knowing the best strains for you, uh, because with cannabis, sometimes the THC can have too much of a cerebral effect. And that can actually help to uh, exacerbate post-traumatic stress disorder. But depending on your endocannabinoid system, that might not be the case. So knowing whether or not a sativa or an indica is going to be good for you. Why are you medicating? What are you trying to medicate for? And not medicating to suppress your feelings, but medicating so that way you can um, you know, start to form a new relationship with how you feel about those things, kind of move past those traumas, identify them, and use cannabis to help you do that. I know we're really frontiering this new recreational you know, market, but I always like to really emphasize the importance of the plant-based medicine. Right on. Yes. Thanks for joining us, Amber. Glad yes. you're here. I've already Sorry. introduced you at the beginning, so folks already know who you are. But we're gonna we're gonna deal you right in here. So so uh, the question is, um, you know, with your uh, background as a veteran, um, how are you able to leverage that experience from the service to better serve veterans? Um, here in the cannabis industry and, and the goal we're trying to get at is so other people can emulate your experience and use their uh, experience in the military to also provide aid to uh, to their uh, uh, veteran brothers in arms. Sure, so um, I was an ROTC kid. Uh, I was in ROTC out through high school and uh, I went through a uh, officer training program when I was in college and so um, and I'm a veteran of the Coast Guard. And uh, I'm also the child of a uh, combat veteran. Uh, my dad was uh, in Vietnam. Uh, he got a purple heart and he was injured several times. Uh, so I definitely know firsthand, even though I'm not a combat veteran, seeing a, a PTSD 
from you know someone very close to me, my dad. And uh, I would say, you know, um, I, I've taken a lot. Uh, I mean, uh, obviously, when, when I was in the military, I got a, a ton of leadership training, and uh, that's definitely helped me in the cannabis industry to uh, kind of uh, discuss um, and not just discuss, but I would say uh, take a lot of issues that are difficult for people to uh, maybe comprehend or understand and uh, kind of bring those issues to light. Uh, I, I uh, co-founded uh, a nonprofit organization called Supernova Women, and uh, what we do is uh, we empower people of color to become self-sufficient shareholders in the cannabis industry. We do that through education, advocacy, and networking, um, lots of uh, engaging with our uh, local and city, uh, city and state officials, um, uh, hosting workshops for folks, and things like that. So uh, <clears throat> I would say that uh, even though my, my focus has been not necessarily um, veteran focus, but uh, more uh, women and people of color, but um, a lot of the, uh, the things and everything I learned, um, the training that I got uh, in the military has definitely helped me to uh, kind of uh, push uh, tough agendas forward. <laughs> and um, I've also been, uh, I, I suffer from lupus, so um, I've been like a, a very strong patient advocate. And um, I feel like, uh, you know, all of those things have really uh, kind of helped me uh, uh, at least the uh, the military has helped me to um, get the gain the skills and uh, help, really helped to develop uh, the skills that I have to uh, like I just mentioned kind of push a lot of these uh, issues and agendas forward. Um, as far as uh, uh, veterans in the military and how I um, interact w with them in in cannabis, uh, it's been really interesting. Um, there have been, uh, my first interaction actually here in um, the Bay, I moved here four years ago, and uh, I used to go to a dispensary. I, I worked for an edibles company, so I was running around uh, constantly uh, visiting different dispensaries, and a dispensary that I used to go to all the time that I really remember was the Hemp Center in, uh, in San Francisco, and uh, <clears throat> that dispensary had a ton of veterans that used to hang out in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, it was like a dad area. It was kind of like a, yeah, they had a lounge. And a uh, bunch of uh, veterans used to just hang out there, so I would go there all the time and uh, pass out edibles, just free edibles to all the veterans. And uh, a really good friend of mine also uh, has a veterans uh, group, uh, Operation EVAC. Uh, his name is Ryan Miller. He's a, uh, a veteran of the uh, Marine Corps. And uh, 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 he hosts a, uh, like a uh, community type group um, uh, at different dispensaries around the Bay Area. And uh, he started actually at my dispensary, uh, Magnolia, here in uh, West Oakland. And uh, yeah, it was just, it's really interesting to see how, um, People are trying to help the veterans um, within the cannabis community. Um, obviously, uh, 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 access to uh, low cost or free uh, compassion uh, medicine is uh, is really important. And uh, uh, yeah, right, right. You know, it's an interesting thing to point out that. Uh, you know, after after other wars, um, you know, especially the the wars that our, our grandparents were in, when soldiers came back, they had places like the VFW halls to to meet at, and and slowly that that model it isn't quite as robust as it was um, for the generations before us, and um, and uh, you know everywhere I I travel in the country, you find all the huge value that vets get from the cannabis lounges. I mean, it, the cannabis itself can help a whole range of, of, of symptoms they may need relief from, but more importantly, it provides that gathering place where you can um, uh, share experiences with others, uh, with people that you trust, 
and uh, in, in many ways it's kind of um, it's uh, supplanting what the what the, the VFW halls um, did and and this is probably a little bit on the better side because it's around cannabis and not booze too yeah so so you're both leaders of cannabis companies and also leaders within your own cannabis scenes so I'm curious to know what programs do either your businesses have or other uh, programs that you are in your scenes that you find um, work most effectively um, to reach out to veterans and get them properly involved. And, I, and, I, and just so you know where I'm going with this is, you know, a lot of people are going to see the video and they're going to feel inspired and they're going to want to start doing things at their local, you know, wherever they live in the country, right? So my goal for this is for for us to kind of, you know, put some ideas in the ears of people in the audience of what they might be able to do where they live. So what have you both seen that, that seems to be working effectively? Thank you. Uh, so if you wanna get veterans involved, the best thing to do is to go on to social media. Social media is becoming huge, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, hashtag veterans, hashtag free, hashtag education, hashtag cannabis, it's gonna start to get some traction. In New England, for the longest time, veterans didn't have any resources. And that's when somebody named Derek Cloutier and Sean Judge formed the New England Veterans Alliance, which has been operational for the last two years. They are now a registered nonprofit organization. And what they've started to do is to hold monthly meetings where veterans can come, we can smoke cannabis, we can relax, enjoy each other. And then they've taken it a step further where they reached out to me and they said, hey, Ellen, you do education? You're a veteran, come on board. So what I do is sometimes I'll hold uh, free educational classes for veterans or the classes that I'll have, I will uh, reach out to my network. Your network is your network. Who do you know and what can they do? So I'll reach out to uh, like Magic Butter or different seed companies that have helped me out like Homegrown Natural Wonders. Um, and then another one is the uh, California Seed Vault and they'll send me genetics and I'll give them away to veterans for free as a gift. Thank you, recreational use, and now I can give things. I couldn't do that with the medical marijuana program. So now I can give things, and then if I have a raffle, for the money that goes into the raffle, I'll take it and I'll give it right back to that nonprofit organization. And that's in Massachusetts. In Maine, there's the Homegrown Healthcare of Maine, started by Catherine Lewis, uh, Glenn Lewis, and Shauna. And what they do is they also provide free classes for veterans. What? Free classes for veterans. I myself hold free classes for veterans. In Connecticut, there's Canna Health, and we're gonna start holding uh, monthly or quarterly free classes. So just by providing them cannabis education, providing them uh, discounts, or giving them the tools and the resources they need to go further, that helps to strengthen your, um, it helps to strengthen your cannabis community, and it helps to strengthen the veteran community. So you don't have to be a veteran to help a veteran. Uh, Catherine, Shauna, and uh, Glenn are not veterans, but they do see the need for it. They see how it has helped people. So I could not be more thankful to the New England Veterans Alliance, to uh, the Homegrown Healthcare Maine, to Canon Health for recognizing that veterans don't have anywhere to really go uh, in states that don't allow for lounges. We don't have any lounges. We still have to go uh, meet in places and smoke in parking lots, and it's not conducive to helping us not feel like criminals or breaking that stigma and getting us out. So uh, the more we can do for veterans, the more we can offer our veterans to help them succeed on their own is going to be priceless. And here on the West Coast, you have 22 too many, which I love New England Veterans Alliance and I love all these different organizations, but 22 too many has a special place in my heart because they were one of the first. They are so loud, they are so proud. Uh, Patrick Saint is one of their founders. And they are always at the Washington State House. They got PTSD added to their medical marijuana program in Massachusetts. Um, so I've mentioned Maine, I mentioned Mass, I mentioned Connecticut. Uh, there's the Tetra Hydro Club in Rhode Island, which has free days for veterans. And in New Hampshire, there's not really anything going on. They don't have a conducive a uh, medical program and they do not have a recreational program. So uh, with their medical marijuana program, they didn't even have post-traumatic stress disorder as a qualifying condition. And that's when all the veterans got together and we said, this is unacceptable. And we went to their state house uh, for one of their hearings and we all testified. There were about uh, 10 of us. And with our voices, with our um, service, with our actual stories, it's not anecdotal evidence, it is, my, it is my life. 
and I need this medicine, and we were able to get post-traumatic stress disorder added to the state of New Hampshire, which is huge because on the East Coast, they're probably one of the furthest states back from being where they need to be to have a functional medical marijuana program, and they're so far out from having a recreational program. So getting veterans involved, and especially getting vet veterans involved in lobbying is gonna be huge, lobbying and activism. I've had times where people from different organizations would call me and say, hey, Ellen, I really need you to come to the state house, or I need you to testify X, Y, or Z, and it's because you're educated, and also you're a veteran. I need a veteran voice, because when I say, hi, my name is Ellen Brown, I'm a, I'm a student, I'm a caregiver, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a United States veteran, and that's when I notice people go like this, and I notice them start to listen, and go, well, what does she have to say? What does this young veteran have to say? So by being a veteran, your, your voice carries just a little bit more weight, um, or because you're a veteran, maybe somebody who wasn't as apt to listening to, oh, it's cannabis, it's cannabis, it's cannabis, oh, it's a veteran. I love veterans. Okay, what do you have to say? And because you are a veteran, they'll take the time to listen to you. So make sure that um, you know when you're speaking, you're able to articulate that it's helped you and what it's going to be able to do for other veterans. Because it's not just me taking care of myself in Massachusetts and New England, it's about taking care of the entire world and every veteran who needs it. Before you reply to that same question, Amber, there's a couple important things I think that are worth worthwhile to pull out of that. Uh, number one, if you want to start veterans programs in your area, don't be shy about asking for stuff. People want to help veterans. So, um, you know, whether or not you're getting um, uh, free medical marijuana for them, whether or not you're getting growing products or, or tents for them to grow in their homes, um, whether or not it's just access or free tickets or, or tickets to, you know, an, an event or a sports event or anything, people want to help veterans. And if, and if you're going to decide to help veterans in your area, um, you know, there's, 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 there's not many things that will attract um, uh, sick veterans better than letting them know that there's going to be free cannabis provided for them for their aches and pains when they arrive. And then once they're there, you can continue on with the other services that you want to make sure you give them, the, the, the therapy, the, the community, the information about their health and cannabis. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways to, to go about that. All good stuff. So same kind of idea to you, Amber. So, so you're in a different scene than Ellen is. And as you've already said, um, your work um, uh, you know, certainly touches on veterans, but, but more specifically minorities and women and, 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 um, and others who may uh, maybe even farther out of, of the, the mainstream and have even more unique needs. So, so what kind of programs do you see being offered that, that you're finding to be effective that other people might be able to model elsewhere in the country? Absolutely. So uh, as we mentioned before, and we kind of talked about uh, camaraderie is a really big thing. Uh, obviously, in the military, you uh, develop some uh, friendships and relationships that last for a whole lifetime. And um, <clears throat> those things are very powerful. You go through all kinds of uh, experiences together. and. Um, at, and uh, that's really important uh, for people to get together and discuss and share, uh, uh, like at the VFW. Yeah. And uh, since those things, uh, as, as we spoke about, are kind of dwindling away, um, creating these support groups for people to come together and share their stories is still very vital and uh, very important. So uh, groups like uh, Operation EVAC, like I mentioned before, um, that, that's a, a Bay Area group. Uh, they meet at a couple different dispensaries. They meet at uh, set, even seven stars right here in Richmond. And uh, they get together and uh, just kind of discuss and talk about uh, the issues that they're having, issues that they're facing, and, and just, you know, being a veteran and navigating um, uh, civilian life. And uh, I think that's really important uh, just because, you know, lots of these folks are very lonely. Uh, they might not get out. Um, uh, for you know, whatever reason, it could be health issues, it could be PTSD issues, it could be a number of, uh, of reasons. So, um, supporting those types of, of groups is really important. Um, giving them uh, the resources that they need, whether it be free cannabis, whether it be money. You know, um, here in, in California, actually, I, I believe they just passed uh, an amendment to um, uh, the regulation uh, saying that. Uh, some uh, uh, groups like uh, Operation UVAC can now um, ha uh, have a compassion program to turn around and give uh, veterans free cannabis. And uh, that 
was something that we couldn't do before, but it was lobbied for by the veterans. You know, so um, uh, advocacy is is key. Uh, activism and advocacy is really key in getting these things. I mean, you know, who would have thought that they would have come out with regulations saying you can't give away cannabis anymore? Like, <laughs> come on. So uh, that was really important, but that only happened because uh, veterans spoke up about it. And also, um, uh, to go off of what Ellen was saying, um, uh, Santa Cruz Veterans Alliance is a really great group uh, in, in Santa Cruz. I actually got a chance to go down there and uh, tour their facilities and, and meet those guys. Like, uh, it was about three weeks ago, so that was a really uh, awesome experience. But it, it was one of the nicest facilities I've ever been in. It was clean. It was like, oh yeah, this is, they're ready for an inspection in here. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's some of the best flower I've seen. It's some of the best prices I've seen, you know? Out the door, eights for 45 bucks top shelf. Like, you're not finding that anywhere else in the Bay. So, you know, just and also going to support those uh, those organizations. Santa Cruz Veterans Alliance, their dispensary, their grow, it's all, it's run and supported by mainly veterans. And uh, it's really important for us to uh, to support uh, those types of organizations as well. Right on, that's a good point. So so, so if you're in the room, and but you don't live really local here to California, or if you are watching this video after the event at home, you know, you don't necessarily have to go to Santa Cruz to learn from these groups. Go online and Google their names and, you know, take a look at their flyers. Uh, figure out, you know, uh, uh, how they describe their events, what, what vocabulary they learn, uh, what they, that they use. You can learn from how other groups advertise, how you may want to advertise to be able to reach your particular audience. So, so up to this point, we've talked about, um, uh, about how as a veteran, uh, those skills help you outreach to, to all people, but specifically veterans especially. And then we turned, turned that into, okay, so what kinds of programs are beneficial for veterans? And so let's, let's take that one step farther because I know that veterans themselves are very involved with shaping how cannabis is evolving uh, as an industry. And so why don't we start with Amber this time. Um, so Amber, you know, what are some of the roles that you have seen veterans in, in cannabis um, that, 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 that they are using their, their experience and skills they picked up in the service and they are making major moves in Canvas. And the idea here is to, is to inspire other veterans who may be watching and they're like, but I don't know how to get involved. This is that part. I mean, there's some really awesome veterans right now in Canvas. Uh, Wanda James of Colorado, she's uh, one of the very few uh, black women dispensary owners in the country. Uh, she's, I believe, I don't think she's the only one in Denver, she might be. I think uh, she's the only one in the state of Colorado. Um, so uh, there, she, she was a naval officer. Um, I've actually I've been running into people more and more. Uh, I met uh, someone who's a GM of a really big uh, grow facility and also a processing facility in Monterey, and uh, he was a naval seal. A naval seal. Uh, as I mentioned before, my buddy uh, Ryan Miller, uh, he was in the uh, Marine Corps, and he cuts up. Uh, this group, Operation Evac. Uh, uh, there's a, I have a friend down in LA, Jay Green. Uh, she's been working to kind of organize a lot of the POC, uh, people of color, women <coughs> uh, veterans. And she's down in LA. So I mean, there's a lot of uh, veterans that are uh, taking lead and I mean, running companies, you know, uh, running companies uh, in leadership positions. But you know, that, that's no surprise, I mean, veterans get the best leadership training, so I would just expect us to be the leaders in, in this industry. So it, so it sounds like you know veterans should just not be shy about taking their shot, because whatever they're interested in, you take that with the training that they've already acquired, and it will very likely pop them to the top of their scene, because a lot of the folks who are coming from you know other scenes may not have that kind of training. They don't, and they, they don't share the same values, you know. I, when I, I start reciting values and stuff, some people laugh at me and think I'm corny, yeah. but I mean, it's, it's true. Like, all these things that I've learned, um, you know, um, honor, uh, courage, uh, devotion to duty, 
uh, respect, all these things. Like, I mean, I carry them throughout everything that I do, and I learned all these core values when I was in the military. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just like, it, once you get these core values and you incorporate them into your everyday life, how can you not be a leader? So I'm going to change the question just a little bit for you. So, so you know, we just talked about how um, you know the kind of leadership um, veterans generally are, but um, I know that both of you are very focused on on uh, giving female veterans the, the the resources, the connections, the introductions, sometimes probably just the encouragement to to go for it, and so. Um, for, for folks who are, who are very interested in helping, you know, promote female veterans in the cannabis scene, um, what are some of the programs that you have seen nationally that seem to be effective in doing that that folks might be able to emulate locally where they live? What's interesting is I have not seen any just primarily female-focused advocacy groups. Um, they kind of, there's a little bit of a wave and then there's kind of a die-off. Uh, veterans make up about 7% of the population, and female veterans are probably 2% of that percentage, so it's a small percent of a small percent. Mm -hmm. For example, with this panel for you know females in the cannabis indus industry as well as veterans, I had put something on social media saying, I I'd love to get some more female veterans involved, and the only, and I'm so glad Amber's here, and Amber, Amber was one of the only veterans who was a, a female veteran, there are plenty of male veterans in the cannabis space, and then she was a, a woman of color here in California. It was perfect, but it was it, Amber. And then uh, when I put it online, everybody had maybe one person, two people they could name, but you, could, you couldn't name like 10, 15, like brrr, women in a row that are female cannabis advocates. So with that in mind, I definitely think there's a need, and even going through it and realizing that I don't have a roster of uh, female veterans I could call upon. Amber, you're now on there. Uh, but know, knowing who your who your female veterans are and then what they advocate for. For example, there's a uh, Meek Monique, and she is a breast cancer survivor. She's down in Southern California, and she started Meekwear. So she does a line of apparel and then gives back to veterans in that way. Uh, there's Sarah Stoffner, and what she does is she's an advocate in New York City, and she just got a license to cultivate hemp. Oh, right on. I know. So she got a farm, and she's going to start putting together programs for veterans to come and cultivate, to have a place to talk, to have a place to um, be able to learn a skill set, and then be also have a, have a family and a purpose. Um, and not that they don't have a purpose now, but some veterans, once they get out of the service and go back in the civilian world, they, they kind of isolate themselves, very much so. They don't even know where to start. So having programs like uh, what Sarah is going to put together is going to be crucial for getting people back out of the house, helping them uh, reacclimate. And when she started to put together that program, she called me and she said, Ellen, I need help with grow classes. So I'm going to be facilitating those grow classes. And if we need business, we're going to call we're going to call our good friend Amber. And if we need apparel, we're going to call Monique. So um, within the cannabis community, the female veterans are kind of starting to figure out who each other, who we are, what what skill sets we have, and how do we work together? Because there's absolutely strength in numbers, and there's definitely strengths when we have a, a unified voice. A unified veteran voice, whether or not it's just females or males or all together, we're unstoppable. When we get together and we put our minds to something, I really loved how you brought up the core values in the Air Force. Our core values are uh, integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. And I've absolutely carried those values over into my canvas work. I want to make sure that there is um, that idea of integrity first. I'm not telling veterans, come to these classes and you know, you'll take that cannabis and it'll cure your PTSD. Absolutely not. I tell them about their own endocannabinoid system, dosing. I give them resources so they're able to better um, take care of themselves with the, ser the service before self. It's not about promoting Ellen Brown. It's about promoting the cannabis, the industry, the veterans. So making sure that the, the focal point of everything I'm doing is to not to um, highlight myself, but to highlight the cause. Um, and excellent service for itself, excellence in all we do, and just making sure that those core values have uh, really, really stayed firm. I think that once you go into the military, I don't know what the other core values are for the Coast Guard and the Marines, but I know that we all kind of have uh, an amount of camaraderie where we know that we've all been taught to 
do the right thing in, in such a way that it's it's integral. It's actually a part of who I am and a part of the way I address people. I carry myself. And when you meet another veteran, especially another female veteran, you can you can almost always tell. It's our posture, the way we hold ourselves, the way we sit up straight. Um, and by the way that we, we take the time and we're passionate. You can see how Amber has so much passion for what she does. She's a, a female veteran and then she takes that a step further and she goes, well, how can I help out my minority you know, brothers in arms? How can, I, how can I help this? How can I do with business? So she found that business was the best uh, avenue for her and I found that education and advocacy has been uh, my best avenue to really help propel those other veterans and to get them uh, where they need to be. Uh, veterans usually are very self-sufficient. They don't need a lot, but once you have that support system and you feel unstoppable, I think you kind of become unstoppable. Everybody thrives with more support, that's for yeah. certain. And you know, something that's really interesting that came out there is that you know, in so much of the cannabis industry, um, there are more people than there are opportunities. Uh, there's, there's more people who want bud tender jobs than can get them. There's more people who are running businesses than there is room for those businesses. And our industry is going to have quite a shakeout. But from what I'm hearing, if you are a woman veteran, um, there's a dearth of you in the industry. And so um, you should feel encouraged, um, not the fact that, oh my gosh, all your friends are saying there's no jobs in the industry or, or, or there's no room for you to start a company, um, just the opposite. Uh, you know, clearly there are, are resources available to you. People want you to play in the sandbox, and and, and the <laughs> likelihood of, of sharing their toys increases. Please. And not only that, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, a lot of businesses are incentivized to hire uh, veterans. I even know that uh, if you're applying for a dispensary per, uh, license in Merced, which is in Central Valley in California, you get extra points if you're a veteran. Well, there so, you go. <laughs> you know, it, 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 the the industry is coming hit to uh, how uh, the, the issues that veterans face, um, how veterans need to be included in the industry, and uh, figuring out some uh, pretty creative ways to, uh, to add veterans into the mix. Right on, so just raise your hand and then expect to be aggressively recruited. So, yeah. so that's an inspiring thing. So, so we're reaching the end of our time. But, um, um, we probably have time for one more question. But uh, um, do we have a, a question from the audience that uh, anybody wants to give our panel before we wrap up? No, so not immediately. And that have, sometimes happens with morning. <laughs> morning, everybody's still uh, tucked into their coffee. So, so let's end with one more question just about for the, for the veterans who have been listening uh, to the panel today and um, you know, you've shaken some things loose for them, right? They're suddenly seeing, oh, maybe there's some opportunity for me either to you know, participate in the cannabis industry, uh, either starting a company or, or working on a team of a company, or maybe they just want to um, go to one of these lounge experiences that you're describing where uh, they, can, they can meet people with shared experiences and learn how um, cannabis can help their endocannabinoid system, which in turn helps everything. Um, what are some uh, simple first steps that they can take now to help open those doors? Um, really just uh, get involved, you know. Um, look up some uh, uh, veteran support groups and uh, just be present. You know, the, a lot of people ask how can they get into the industry, um, what can I do again, and really just uh, just show up. It, it's, yeah, I mean, 15 it's, seconds on Google may be all it takes. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. For veterans that want to get into the cannabis industry, uh, there is no barrier. There is absolutely no governing body. There is nobody necessarily really in charge of this. Every state governs themselves uh, very uniquely, so there could be opportunities that are available to you in some states more than other states. And if you're in a state, uh, I primarily think of the South and the Midwest as just being so very far behind. It's like the coastal states really got it going on, and then in the middle we need all this help. Uh, so getting those veterans to come out and say, I'm a, I'm a United States Air Force veteran, I need cannabis. I need it for my medicinal purposes and I also need it in a recreational market because it's a multi-million dollar industry that I want to be a part of. Uh, and something that we haven't really touched on is the fact that veterans need to get together and be very vocal because we need to get cannabis to not be a Schedule One substance anymore. Uh, and that's something that we need to take on federally. And I feel like the federal government is a lot more apt to hear the voices of veterans 
uh, talk about why they need it for medicinal uses, for um, to propel themselves and their businesses. And our voices, I really believe, are what's going to help to create that much needed paradigm shift so that way cannabis can be uh, there for everybody who needs it, especially those veterans. We do not get cannabis prescribed to us by the VA. We get pharmaceuticals prescribed to the VA. We're losing 22 veterans a day to being overprescribed. If we lost as many uh, people in Congress as we do veterans, would they be gone in 25 days? We're losing veterans at a staggering, alarming, unacceptable number, and uh, getting them involved and getting them away from those pharmaceuticals or letting them know about alternative health is going to help to save their lives. So it really is that important. Right on. Well, thank you both for uh, sharing your experiences with us today. Um, they'll be available, both uh, both Ellen and Amber will be available afterwards to uh, a answer your questions. Thank you very much to Ellen Brown and Amber Center. Thank you. Thank you.